So good afternoon. My name is Eric Prosco. I'm extension weed specialist at the University of Georgia. Uh, I work on several crops, including peanuts, field corn, soybeans, sunflowers, grain sorghum, and a few other smaller acreage crops. Today I'm going to be visiting with you about field corn weed control, and I'll give you some updates on some things that we've been doing here at the University of Georgia, some problems we've been seeing, uh, maybe some things to think about in your weed control program if you're struggling. So with that, I'll get started. Uh, before I start any corn talk, I like to try to bring the economics into it because historically in my career, it's been a challenge to get growers to spend maybe a little more money on field corn weed control. But if you look at the economics, we can justify it. And this particular slide is a summary of, of uh, yield data that we've collected over the last several years about what happens uh, when we don't control weeds. And you'll notice this is basically a, a from 2007 where we looked at the yields from treated plots and untreated plots and uh, we get the yield loss. On this particular slide, this shows you what happens when you don't control your weeds and how much yield loss you could expect. And over several years, we've averaged about 34% yield loss uh, when we didn't do anything for weeds. And so if you do the math on that, uh, you can certainly justify spending $20 or more or $20 to $25, we don't want to spend uh, too much, but we can spend $20 to $25 on weed control and it certainly would pay for itself. So if you're thinking about weed control and maybe you're struggling or you're looking for some new ideas, um, I have a couple of questions for you. This is normally what I would ask you if we were sitting face to face. Um, what technologies are you planning? Are you planning Roundup? Are you planning Liberty? Are you planning conventional? Uh, are you going to need counter for soil insect for soil insect problems? Because uh, if you do, that affects our ability to use certain post-emergence herbicides. And then is atrazine still working for you on pigweed? I'm going to assume that it doesn't, right? Because we've had some problems here in Georgia with resistance, as well as some failures over the last few years. So I'm going to assume that uh, atrazine may not be working as good, good for you as it used to. Used to. And then what will be planted after the field corn? In Georgia, we could potentially plant soybeans after corn in the same season, so that may affect our herbicide choice uh, earlier in the spring. And in Florida, you might be planting something uh, else. So you have to know what you're planting. So a general plan of attack for, for most gro corn growers would be this. Uh, you've got to start clean. Uh, that's our number one priority. If you don't start clean, you're probably going to be battling weeds the whole year, spending a ton of money and uh, not doing a good job of managing your weeds. Using a pre-emergence herbicide, and you've got several options there. We can use atrazine pre. Uh, we can use dual or warn or outlook pre. We've got several options to use a uh, pre-emergence, but a pre-emergence herbicide will give you some protection in wet years. If you uh, don't put out a pre and it starts to get rainy, and then you can't get back in the field, you might have a mess. So having a residual herbicide out of planting would help keep some of those weeds uh, controlled while you were, before you were able to get back into that field uh, with a post-emergence herbicide. All right, then we're going to follow up with a timely post-emergence spray of, of various things. Historically, we've been using a lot of Roundup and Atrazine, and I'm of the opinion that that's probably not good enough anymore. Uh, we need to be thinking about other things we can tank mix with that, and that could be several options. Uh, we have a, a, several new products as, as well as some older ones out there that we can tank mix or we could go to a liberty-based system. Uh, you've got some flexibility there in how you manage your weeds. But the point, main point I want to stress is that you may already realize that if you've just been spraying Roundup and Atrazine, it may not be working as good for you as it once was. And also want to stress that the timely post-emergence application is extremely important. I want to see you be going back in your field somewhere around the V3 to V4 to V5 stage and that'll give you the best opportunity to make an application to small weeds. With that in mind, uh, over the years, as you can tell, I've got a little bit of gray hair, so I've been around for a little while. You know, we tend to delay applications in corn for various reasons, whether it's weather related or we start planting something else. Uh, and that can be a problem for a couple reasons. You know, I want to encourage you to spray earlier. 
uh, for a couple reasons. We want to try to get weeds when they're small. We want to avoid spraying corn when it's starting to go reproductive. And then coverage can be affected. And so this past year I did a study in a grower's field with a commercial applicator to try to hone in on how coverage is affected by delaying application. And I'm going to share that data with you right now. So no one's ever seen this. This is brand new. So in 2020 in a commercial field, uh, what I did is uh, I got the grower to spray whatever he was going to spray. In this particular year, he was spraying Roundup and Atrazine, ironically. Uh, and then before he sprayed, we put blocks in the field at a 2-inch height and a 6-inch height to simulate weeds. And then uh, we evaluated the spray coverage. And so over time, uh, we did it at 10 days, 20 days, and 30 days after planting uh, to look at the differences in of coverage between just a simple 10-day delay, uh, delay. And here's just a quick picture of the spray card analysis. And if I can set this up for you, on the left-hand side, you have uh, the spray cards at the 2-inch height. The top is when the corn was 20 days after planting or in the V4 stage. The bottom is the corn at the 2-inch block. It was at the V6 stage. And the same thing would be for the 6 inches. But I think it's obvious visually you can see there's less coverage in when we waited just 10 days. We have, in fact, if you look at the numbers, we lost or we reduced coverage by 40% just in a delay from 20 days after planting to 30 days after planting. So when we sprayed at the V4 stage, we had much better coverage than we sprayed at the V6 stage. So that's just another uh, reason why I want you to think about spraying around the V3 or V4 stage. All right, so in the next uh, series of slides, I'm going to show you some pictures from our field research in 2020, just to give you a visual uh, of some of the various treatments that we're evaluating and some products you may not have heard of or maybe you're thinking about using. First, I want to start off in general. Uh, one of the, the standard treatments that I like to use in all my testing is a Roundup Atrazine and Prowl treatment. That's the standard herbicide program that I compare all new things to as they're developed or uh, as they're brought to me in the development stage. And you'll notice in this picture, uh, the two rows on the left are treated with a Roundup Atrazine and Prowl, where the untreated is on the right. You can see in this particular year, uh, there was uh, a lot of wild radish as well as several grass species and Palmer amaranth. But for me, Roundup and Atrazine and Prowl is still a very good treatment. It may not be for you, depending upon the history of your fields. Here's just another picture of a, another test. Again, I, as I mentioned, I use Roundup, Atrazine, and Prowl as my standard. And here's just another illustration of the effectiveness of that treatment for me at this location. Again, it may not be good enough for you. Now, one of the questions that I always get about Prowl and corn is why are we going to use Prowl and corn and does it hurt yield when we do? Because there have been some historical issues perhaps with prowl use in corn. And the main reason I'm using prowl in corn over the top is for residual control of grasses, particularly Texas millet. In Georgia, Texas millet is our number one grass problem. Some of the other grass herbicides don't work as well on that species. So uh, we'll, we tend to want to tank mix prowl with everything that we can to help us manage Texas millet. Now, here is a slide. I've worked with one of my colleagues at North Carolina State, which shows the benefit of adding Prowl to different her herbicide treatments. And you'll notice in the yellow bar is no Prowl, and the blue bar is where we have Prowl. And it's obvious that where we've got the Prowl in the mix, uh, we're getting better control of Texas millet. Now, the other question that, we, that I mentioned is, does Prowl hurt yields? Of course, all herbic any herbicide can hurt yield if we don't use it the right way. But if we use Prowl the right way in corn, I'm confident that we're not going to hurt yields. And this is just an example of a summary of some work we've been doing uh, where we compared Roundup and Atrazine with and without Prowl. And really, we have, have seen no effects, negative effects of Prowl on yield. Well, we've got to use it the right way. We've got to plant corn at least an inch and a half deep. We've got to make sure that furrow is closed. Uh, we don't want the prowl uh, going into the furrow. And then we're going to apply that prowl over the top. We can go up to 30-inch tall corn, but again, I would prefer that uh, 
that you're going to be making that post-emergence treatment somewhere around the V3 to V4 stage, which would be much smaller than 30-inch corn. All right. So here's just another, another option for you. In the last several years, uh, we've had a lot of interest in a product called Loudus from Bayer. Um, it's been a good product for us, and it's something we started to use more uh, in response to the issues that we've had around atrazine. Again, you'll notice on the left, I have an untreated. On the right, I have a combination of Roundup, Loudus, atrazine, and in this case, Prowl, four-way mix. Uh, I've got several growers in Georgia that actually prefer to use this, again, because of the problems with atrazine that they've had and the problems with Texas millet. If you've never used Loudus before or other bleaching type herbicides, it's not uncommon to get some injury that you're not used to seeing. Uh, we may see some bleaching, we may see some stunning, uh, the corn may turn white. So whenever you're using a product like Loudus or there's a couple others just like it, uh, it's likely that that could happen, particularly when the weather conditions are cool. All right. Again, here's just another picture of a, another common program in our area. In this case, I have a product called Halix GT in here. Halix GT is a three-way mix that's got glyphosate in it, that's got esmetolachlor or dual, and it's got uh, mesotrione. So it's a three-way mixture already prepared for you. We have a fair amount of Halix GT being used in Georgia, and it looks pretty good. Um, another newer product that's been on the market is called Impact or Topramizone. It's another bleaching herbicide. Uh, again, I think you'll, if you look at my slides, you'll notice that pretty much everything that I use in corn works well, uh, at least on the species that we have here. And as um, long as we're using them the right way, we should get pretty good control. But again, this would be something that we would most likely add to a Roundup and Atrazine program to give us a little better control. Now, one of the questions that I've gotten over the last few years is, especially because of the, the hybrids that we plant in Georgia, you know, two of our most common hybrids are 6208 or 1870, and both of those hybrids are Roundup and Liberty resistant. And so the last couple of years, particularly growers have had asked me, hey, can I mix Roundup and Liberty together? Is that a good idea or not? You know, and, and if you think about it to start, you're thinking, well, maybe that's not a good idea because they have different modes of action. They work differently. They may affect each other's ability to work. And that can happen. We know that when we mix Roundup and Liberty together, there have been reports of antagonism or where we lose control of, of certain weed species. But this year, again, because the, the ton of questions that I've gotten about it, I decided to do a little more work, and it was a very good treatment. So I'm, I'm positive about uh, how Roundup and uh, Liberty are working together, but certainly I need to do some more work uh, on that tank mix to see what's going to happen on other species. Uh, and when do we see antagonism or less control when we mix those uh, particular products. But at least temporarily it looks pretty good. All right, here's just another picture of, of in that same field where we've got Roundup and Liberty together. And you can see they look very well. This is about almost 70 days after planting. Now, if, as we go through the winter meetings, of course, our winter meetings are going to be different like we are today. But when, you're, when you watch something on TV or you read a, mag a farm magazine, you're probably going to see an ad for newer products that can potentially be used in corn. And you might wonder, well, is that something I should try? Is it going to be better than, than what I'm already doing? Uh, what's the data say? Has anybody looked at it? And so there are several products that we're currently testing. Uh, these are in the early, I mean, they're, they're labeled for use, but typically at the University of Georgia, we don't officially endorse or recommend a product until we have at least two or three years of solid data on the performance. That's to make sure that uh, we're not going to see any surprises when a grower gets it in his hand in a commercial field. So there are a couple of products out there that you're going to be reading about and you know they're going to say they're new and they're better and they're great and I'll leave that up to you, to you to decide. You know we are evaluating them and they do seem to work well. Are they any better than anything else? That remains to be seen. Uh, but we've got several products coming out or they're labeled, labeled now but they're relatively new. Synate is a combination of glufosinate and topramizone, or that would be Liberty and Impact. Impact Core is a, a combination of topramizone and acetaclor. That would be Impact plus um, Harness. Acuron GT is a little twist on the current formulation of Acuron. That's a four-way mix, as you can see here. And then Shield X is another 
a new bleaching or HPPD herbicide uh, that's being developed uh, by uh, Summit Agro. Here's just a couple of quick pictures to show you. This is a, uh, a shot of the Synate product that I mentioned, which is again would be a, a combination of Liberty and Impact. You can see it's very effective. Um, here's the Impact Core that we evaluated last year, also very effective. Uh, we did see a little bit more injury with Impact Core than we had uh, anticipated. You'll notice in this particular picture we've got some leaf necrosis, but uh, the corn recovered uh, from that injury. Typically when we get injury in corn, unless it's uh, something that we weren't expecting, the corn will recover uh, without effects on yield. And then here's that Acuron GT product, again looking good. Again, as I mentioned earlier, all the products we test in corn seem to work well, but I'm pretty timely. So that's my challenge to you is if, if you can be timely, you can make just about any of these herbicides work well for you. When we get into problems is when we're not timely and we're spraying big weeds and we're not getting the coverage that we need uh, because of the size of the plant, which I showed you earlier from the large on-farm study that I did. And here's the Shield X uh, material that's uh, been out there. I've seen a few advertisements for this. Again, it looks good, um, and so there are some things that you can try uh, a little bit differently. All right, now, one of our biggest challenges that we have in corn is morning glory control. That's probably our public enemy number one. And the problem that we have is because we grow corn so early in the south, you know, we're planting in February and March, and we're getting the corn off in uh, August and September, we don't have a herbicide that can go out at planting that will last through that entire season. And so we get early season control and we're, we're going along well. And then as the corn starts to dry down and the sunlight gets to the soil, we get a reemergence of morning glory. And that morning glory can become a problem with harvest. Now, we've been something, something we've been working on and it's on our radar, but it's going to be a challenge just because of the environment that we live in. I would encourage you to think about uh, pulling out your lay-by rig if you have one of those laying around the farm because uh, that is a way for us to get a herbicide in the crop a little later in the season and then we can get it to the ground. We're not going to be spraying you know, four foot tall corn over the top and none of that's getting to the ground. This will give us an opportunity to put that product right on the ground and help us keep the morning glory from emerging. Now, is there a miracle cure out there? There is not. You know, right now we, we generally recommend EVIC in that application, but if, uh, EVIC tends to be an interesting product, costs a little bit more money than anybody wants to spend, uh, doesn't mix really well in water, and it's hard to get because most of the EVIC is used in sugarcane in South Florida. So it's difficult to get, but you can, if, you can get it if you want, really wanted to. All right, a couple other things, and I'll, I'll uh, end my presentation. It's probably more important now than it has ever been to think about managing weeds in cornfields after you harvest the corn. Typically, that's a challenge for growers, especially in the South, because when, when we get done harvesting corn, we're right in the peanut season, and so everybody's thinking about peanuts. But if we allow weeds to go to seed in those cornfields, all the work you may have done in the past year or several years has gone to waste. Because remember, in this case, this is Palmer amaranth. We can produce a half a million seed. You get a few plants in there, and then you can uh, really fill that weed seed bank back up. So uh, I encourage you to think about managing weeds after corn harvest is just as important as how you manage weeds in the crop uh, because that's helping you long term. That's going to help your whole farm management program if you prevent seeds weeds from going to seed in your cornfields. And again, this is a picture of Palmer amaranth. You always get asked, then, well, what kind of herbicide program do you like? I'm a big fan of tillage. I know some people aren't, but I like tillage when we can use it because there's no steel resistant weeds out there currently. But if we can't use tillage or you don't want to use tillage, one of my favorite treatments for Palmer amaranth is a combination of Gramoxone and Metribuzin. It does a very good job as well as give us residual control. There are other options for you. That's one of many uh, that we suggest. The other weed that we've got to worry about after harvest is tropical spiderwort or Bengal dayflower. And if you have that in your fields, you're well aware of what it looks like. Uh, this is from many seasons ago when we first started working on that. This is a cornfield in Grady County after harvest. And you can see that if we didn't do anything with this particular field, 
that plant can produce seed in 40 days after it comes up out of the ground. So we can get a lot of seed produced between corn harvest and when we get a frost, first frost, or even if we get a frost. We may not get a hard frost in the south like they do up in the northern region. So here's just another example. Again, I like tillage when I can use it for tropical spiderwort, but we can use herbicides. Um, I like, uh, in this case, I've got a split application of, of Gramoxone here. We could also use 2,4-D. We could also use AIM. So we have several options to manage tropical spiderwort after corn harvest. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here and just kind of generally summarize, hopefully, the, the points that I made today. Uh, when we think about weed control in corn, we want to start clean, use a pre, be timely with our post-emergence herbicides. We really need to be thinking more about if I'm just using Roundup and Atrazine, has that been good enough? If it's not, what can I tank mix it to make my life easier? Um, using a lay-by rig for morning glory control, and then don't forget about those weeds after harvest, especially uh, Palmer amaranth and tropical spiderwort. We need to do something in the fall. Uh, to keep them from going to seed. With that, that concludes my presentation. And I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you, and I'm always more than happy to visit with uh, any field corn grower in the South if I can help you.